Hi, Hope. My name is Ben. I'm one of the pastors here at Lutheran Church of Hope. And my name's Shannon. I'm the Global Missions Coordinator. We're so happy you're here. That's right. We believe it's no accident you're here. We're praying for you. And whether you're here in person or one of the thousands of locations that are worshiping with us online, we're glad you're here. If this is your first time online, we just want to extend a special welcome. I don't remember the first time that I came to Hope um, because it was feels like so long ago, but you are already <laughs> part of the family, so welcome. Absolutely. Uh, if you need prayer, I want you to know we're praying for you already, but if you would like for us to pray for you in a specific way, you can go to our prayer wall on our website. You go to our website, and it's up on the right hand uh, upper side, or you can go uh, to lutheranchurchofhope.org slash prayer dash wall, and that's a great way for you to get connected. Don't forget to sign up for VBS on the website and come see us at Taste of Hope. And with that, let's get ready for worship. Good morning, Hope. Whether you are in the room here with us in West Des Moines or joining us online, I invite you to stand as we worship a God who overcame sin and death so we could have life in him and through him. Let's sing. Now the darkness fades into new beginnings as we lift our eyes. To a hope beyond All creation waits With an expectation To declare the reign of the Lord our God We will not be moved When the earth gives way For the risen one is over now And for every
Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to all of you. I'd give you a handshake or a fist bump if you were here in person, but I can wave. That's a good way to greet people from a distance. <laughs> it is. We're so glad that you joined us wherever you're at. Um, again, just a huge warm welcome to you. We've yeah. got some announcement coming up, so stay tuned for Hope 360. Absolutely. See you in a few. This time, go ahead and take a seat as we continue with our Hope 360. This is Hope 360, your weekly look around Lutheran Church of Hope. I'm Jamie Richards. And I'm Mark Brandt. Summer is in full swing, and our Power Life Ignition Ministries are gearing up for their second First Wednesday Summer Bash event of the year on Wednesday, July 6th. All students entering grades 6 through 12 are invited to join us for an outdoor event in the parking lot with live music, free food, fun games, and prizes from 7.30 to 9 p.m. I want to invite all incoming sixth graders to outgoing 12th graders to our second first Wednesday of the summer. Here in the West Moines parking lot, July 6, 7.30 to 9 p.m., you can come for food trucks, games, prizes, free walking tacos, and this month, a petting zoo. We would love to see you there. If you know any students, send them our way, and you can register online. Registration is available on our website by clicking the first Wednesday graphic on our homepage. We hope to see you there. Hope Sports Ministry is also excited to host an upcoming soccer clinic on Saturday, July 2nd at the Mid-American Recplex in West Des Moines. Join us as we partner with the Des Moines Menace for a one-day soccer clinic. Kids ages three to six will be in action from nine to 11 that morning, and kids over the age of seven will have their clinic from noon to two. Cost is $40 and includes a t-shirt. Register your child today. And the fun continues with Hope Ranch. Vacation Bible School is less than three weeks away, and we can't wait to have the biggest Jesus party of the year. If you haven't registered your child yet, don't worry, there's still time. Just head to our website where you can get them registered today. Staff and volunteers continue to be hard at work finalizing all of the details, including our song leaders who met this past week for awesome group training sessions. It was so fun seeing the songs come alive as they learned this year's moves and to see the smiling faces of so many of the volunteers who make BBS each year such a success. If you've signed up to be a volunteer, be sure to join us for one of our upcoming volunteer training sessions on July 6th. 9th or 12th, where you'll learn more about what to expect and what you'll be doing. Many volunteers are still needed, so if you or someone you know is interested in serving, please visit our website to learn more or give our youth and family team a call this week. And lastly, nothing says summer quite like our annual Taste of Hope Summer Festival, happening once again this year downtown at Waterworks Park Amphitheater on Saturday, July 23rd from 3 to 9 p.m. We'll come together as one church in multiple locations for free food, music, art activities, games, worship, and more. The whole community is invited, so be sure to spread the word. As a part of Taste of Hope, we also have our annual Taste of Hope golf outing, which kicks off the festivities on Friday, July 22nd at Beaver Creek Golf Club. You can register as an individual or with a group and join us for a four-person scramble start from 8 to 1 p.m. In addition, the Taste of Hope 5K and Kids Fun Run will happen the morning of the 23rd, starting and ending in Hope's parking lot. Get your walking and running shoes ready and get your body moving for Jesus. All are welcome, no matter your fitness level. Learn more about all of the Taste of Hope fun on our website. That was your 360 degree look around Lutheran Church of Hope. We're glad you joined us and welcome to Hope. Hi Hope, my name is Ben, I'm one of the pastors here and I'd love to continue to extend the welcome you just received. Uh, we're so glad you're here. We believe it's no accident you're here. We're praying for you. Uh, do you know that God's at work in your life? Sometimes if, amen to that, yeah. It feels like that sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't, but it's always true. God is at work in powerful ways in your life, and we're blessed to be a part of that. As you heard in the Hope 360, there are a lot of different ways to get connected here. It can feel a little overwhelming. You don't have to do everything just find something that's a good fit for you. And if you need help with that, we'd love to help you find a way to get connected. You can find all the details of all the things on the website, uh, or uh, you can have the incorrect answer and come ask me what, what's, what is, when, and you know how it works. Um, 
but I'd love to help you get connected. Um, there are so many good ways to lean into what God's up to in your life, and that's why I'm not the only one up here today. That's right. right? Thank you, Ben. Uh, so here at Hope, uh, we are so fortunate because uh, having a robust internship program has always been a huge part of what we do here at Hope. And so all of us who are pastors have had some sort of an intern experience. Uh, and so we are really excited today to welcome two uh, pastoral interns who are going to be joining us here for the next year. And so I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Thank you. Good morning, Hope. My name is Anna Sagerda, and I am from the Des Moines area. I grew up here at Hope, and I attended seminary at Truett Seminary in Waco, Texas. And I'm happy to be here and honored to serve this congregation that has been a huge part of my faith journey. Good morning. My name is Corey Forsey. I am from Rice Lake, Wisconsin, way up north. Um, and I studied at Luther Seminary in St. Paul, and I'm happy to be down here to finish my journey through seminary towards ordination. Thanks for having me. So when you see Corey and Anna around, be sure to welcome them. Uh, let them know that we're glad to have them here. They learn from us, but we just as importantly get to learn from them as well. So we're really thankful that both of you are here with us. Absolutely. Uh, please join me as we continue our service with prayer. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for the ways you work uh, in our lives. I want to thank you for Anna and the call that you've given her uh, to ministry and for Corey and the call that you've given her. And um, God, I want you to uh, speak to each of us. There's not one person in here that you're not calling to something. Uh, not all of us are called to pastoral ministry. But we're all called to something. God, speak to us today. Let us know uh, what it is that you have in mind for us. Because without a doubt, what you have in mind for us is better than what we have in mind for us. God, thank you that you love us so much, that you're interested, that you care, and that you have a plan for our future, to give us uh, a hope for our future. God, open our hearts to what you're doing because this world is hurting. We all see it, God. You see it too. But you've sent us into this world to be a light to this world. So let us be the light that you've sent us to be. In Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Please pray with me as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. That's it for today's announcements. Uh, our service is going to continue with our Bible reading. Please uh, feel free to join us if you brought your Bible, or you can open your Bible app and join us uh, for the Bible reading. Our Bible reading comes from the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 through 9. Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? Remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from our lives and follow the example of their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So do not be attracted by strange new ideas. Your strength comes from God's grace, and not from rules about food, which don't help those who follow them. Here ends the reading. All right, let's get back up on our feet if you're able to do that. Whether you're in the room again or whether you're joining us online, we're so thankful to get to be here together and worship a God who saves. He's breathing miracles into this place, a God of unity, a God of peace, a God of goodness, a God of joy. That's the God that we come and sing to and worship this morning. Let's lift him up together. The name above the battle, the undefeated Savior stands with me, the fighter for the
Father, thank you that you are here, that you are present, that you inhabit the praises of your people. We know this to be true, so we know that you are present. God, thank you that you make a way when there's no way, that you're a God that keeps his promises, a God that is faithful, a God that we can trust, a God that doesn't make us do anything by ourselves, a God that when we knock on the door, you open it, no questions asked. It doesn't matter what happened yesterday or what's gonna happen tomorrow, you let us in. You call us into relationship with you. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for coming and breaking into this world in a way that we'd never seen, in a way that we'd never known. Jesus, thank you that, that you show us what unity looks like. You show us how to disagree, but be kind. You show us how to argue, but love. Father, this world is pretty broken and we need you. Spirit, this world is broken and we seek your presence through it all. We love you so, so much. And it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Together we said, amen. Please take a seat. Hi. Help! 
you want to see me, you will not do this. You will make an appointment. Dr. Green, how can you diagnose someone as an obsessive compulsive disorder and then act as though I had some choice about barging in? There's not going to be a debate. You must leave. You said you could help me. What was that? A tease? I can help you if you take responsibility to keep you regular You changed the room around. Two years ago. I also regrew my beard, but you're not interested in changes in me. So Shh, it's like I don't I have this mountain of available time. I have to get to my restaurant on time. Now, do you know how hard it was for me to come here? Yes. No, we're not doing this now. I changed just one pattern, as you always said I should. No. Nope. Oh, I read that. Thing. Thank you very much. What if this is as good as it gets? Oh. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Hope. Wherever you are, however you may be joining us, it's so great to be worshiping together right now. My name is Scott Raines. I am the lead pastor at Hope's Ankeny campus, and today we're going to be talking about change. Uh, change is an interesting concept for a lot of reasons. Uh, I think one of the reasons is there's something unifying about change. Uh, it doesn't matter if you would call yourself a Jesus person or not, call yourself a Bible person or not, a church person or not. One of the things we all have in common is there's something going on in your life right now that you wish would change. We all have something in our life that we wish was different. Uh, it could be a job situation something going on in our finances, a relational reality, a health issue. But every single one of us, we have something in our life that we wish would change. And so part of what makes change such an interesting topic to talk about is at the same time, pretty much all of us are resistant to change. We're change averse. We have a strong distaste for change. You ever wonder why that is? Uh, let's dig into it. As, as we get started, let's read this passage from the beginning of Psalm 103. Wherever you are, however you're joining us, let's read this out loud together. Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. Now, psalm 103 is a psalm of King David. And God has done a lot of really good things in King David's life. And yet David is self-aware enough. He is integrated enough, m mature enough, body, mind, spirit. He is wholehearted enough to understand, even with all these good things that God has done for him, sometimes he forgets. H how is that possible? How can King David forget the way God brought him from the pastures outside of Bethlehem, just a shepherd boy, and now he's sitting on the throne in Jerusalem? David can't forget that, right? How could David possibly forget it? The same way that you and I forget the really good things, the powerful, life-giving, life-changing, life-saving things that God does in our life. It turns out it has a lot to do with neuroscience. Are you fascinated by our brains there are people who study our brains, neuroscience, it's amazing some of the discoveries, what they're telling us about the way our brain works, the way our, our brain functions. So we've got short-term memory, we've got long-term memory, and the people who study this thing, they have a name for a part of our brain, they call it the amygdala, and part of the job description of the amygdala is to take in all the experiences of our life. We're always having experience in our life, and the job of the amygdala is to determine, is this something that I need to remember? Is this something that should be stored in our long-term memory? And so as they watch our brain with these really fancy MRI technology, they can watch our brain in real time. And they find out that two-thirds of the neurons of the amygdala are used to detect negative experiences. Those things in our life that we don't particularly like, uh, things that are difficult, hard, challenging, scary, dangerous, unsafe. When the amygdala detects a negative experience immediately, it pushes that experience into long-term memory. And uh, brain scientists think part of the reason behind this is so 
we can quickly recall when we're in a similar kind of situation and we can know, danger, danger, this is something we need to avoid, something we need to uh, not go through. One third of the neurons in the amygdala are used to detect positive experiences, things that fill us with joy, uh, things that give us hope, the kinds of things for which we might want to praise the Lord. But again, as they're watching the way the brain works in real time, when we're going through one of these positive experiences, we have to hold that experience, we have to think about it, hold it in our consciousness for at least 12 seconds before the amygdala will then transfer that into long-term memory. There's a guy named Rick Hansen, a clinical psychologist. He's got his PhD. He has written a number of books, including this book, Hardwiring Happiness. Here's the way he talks about this brain function. The brain is like Velcro for negative experiences, but Teflon for positive ones. You can get compliment after compliment after compliment after compliment, and then one person gives you a criticism, and what do you spend the rest of the weekend thinking about? (laughs) The brain is like Velcro for negative experiences, Teflon for positive ones. Part of the reason we forget the good things that God does for us is our brain is wired to anticipate something negative, something bad is about to happen. Uh, Let's dig even further into this, go uh, a layer deeper. So we got short-term memory, long-term memory. There is a field of neuroscience called interpersonal neurobiology. I'm jealous of people that get to say, yeah, I'm in the field of interpersonal neurobiology. Anyway, uh, they're really fascinating in two different types of long-term memory. We have implicit memory and explicit memory. Explicit memory is what most of us think about when we think about memory. So here's a memory I have from childhood. I grew up about an hour north of here, uh, a farm in north central Iowa, and dad raised beef cattle. And so one year, my 4-H project was to raise a calf that I named Tootsie. Uh, When Tootsie was born, Tootsie had hair that looked like a Tootsie Roll. I named the calf Tootsie. And early on, when uh, Tootsie was really little, I I fed Tootsie with a bottle. And then it got more, uh, you know, grain and corn and silage and, you know, big cow food, that sort of thing. By the end of the summer, Tootsie was big enough, I got to show Tootsie at the Hardin County Fair. Uh, This is a picture of Farmer Scott with Tootsie. My big brother Sean in the background, I don't remember the name of the cow that he showed at the Hardin County Fair, but here's what I want you to do. Turn to somebody close to you and tell them the name of Scott's cow was Tootsie. Go ahead and do that. Tell somebody close to you the name of Scott's cow was Tootsie. All right, really good. Now we're going to do something, all of us together. Uh, Again, if you're on hopeonline.tv or on one of the other Hope campuses or here in West Des Moines, I'm going to ask you a question. I want us to answer the question out loud. The name of the cow that I showed at the Hardin County Fair was what? All right. How kind of you to remember. This is the way our explicit memory works. Explicit memory is our thinking memory. It's our cognitive memory. And, And the way the brain science works, if you hold Tootsie the cow in your awareness, you think about Tootsie the cow for 12 seconds, the amygdala will transfer that memory into a long term memory. You will never forget Tootsie the cow. Sort of. Explicit memory, it's also the memories we forget. So you'll probably forget about Tootsie the Cow pretty quick. Implicit memory works very differently. If explicit memory is cognitive, it's memory we think about, implicit memory is more, it's like a body memory. Uh, uh, It's emotion or feeling memory. Whether we're paying attention or not, whether we're thinking about it or not, implicit memory happens. Example. I'm not a huge fan of dogs. I know a lot of you are. You love your dogs. I'm not a big fan of dogs. And part of the reason why, I got bit in the head by a dog when I was two years old. So here I am now, a full-grown, rather strapping, middle-aged man. (laughs) Whenever I find myself in the presence of a dog, it doesn't matter how cute that dog might be. It doesn't matter how big or small that dog might be. When I'm in the presence of a dog, something in my body, a warning Signal starts going off. Danger, danger, danger. I do not have an explicit memory. I don't remember being bit in the head by a dog when I was two. But when I'm in the presence of a dog, even today, initially my my first instinct, my response is to say, 
you are not safe. This is not good. Something bad is about to happen. Uh, another example. Um, have you ever had a, a time in your life where maybe you overreacted to something that was happening in the moment? Uh, you're having a conversation with a family member or a friend. Or you're in a meeting at work and somebody says something, somebody does something, and immediately inside yourself, you, you, you feel intense emotion rising up inside you. It could be anger, it could be a feeling of anxiousness or uh, being ashamed. And in that moment, you respond and you say something and you do something that causes everybody else to kind of take a step back like, well, Scott got out of bed on the wrong side today, I guess. Later in the day, as you're reflecting back on that moment, on that encounter, on that conversation, you find yourself able to say, I might have overreacted. I might have overreacted. Well, brain science is telling us the more accurate thing to say, instead of saying you overreacted, the more accurate thing to say would be your implicit memory was reacting in that moment. Your brain was taking in what was being said. Your brain was taking in nonverbal cues and interpreting all of that through the grid of your implicit memory. And something that happened in your life maybe years ago, maybe decades ago, Whatever they said or did, in that moment, it felt like it was happening again. Implicit memory, explicit memory. If you're tracking along, maybe you're starting to think, oh, th this is starting to get us into the realm of trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, you, you think of military veterans next weekend, 4th of July weekend. And there are going to be some veterans who hear a firework go off and immediately in their body, they think they're back on the battlefield. They think the enemy is at hand. They think they're, this is a dangerous and unsafe situation. And they're going to have to think themselves to a place where they're able to remind themselves, oh, no, 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 no. That happened a long time ago. In the present moment, I am safe, even though my implicit memory, my body might be telling me I'm not safe. Okay, preacher boy, kind of interesting, but what's the point? <laughs> what does any of this have to do with living a life of faith? Growing as a follower of Jesus Christ. We'll, we'll get there. Kind of the godfather of interpersonal neurobiology is a guy named Daniel Siegel. He works out of uh, UCLA in Southern California. Here's what he says. The brain is an anticipation machine that shapes ongoing perception by what it automatically expects based on prior experience. It's a bit of a mouthful. The brain's an anticipation machine. Our brain is constantly anticipating or predicting what is about to happen. But the prediction is almost 100% based on experiences we have had in the past. And remember, if, if the way memory works our brain is like Velcro for negative experiences. Our brain has primed us, conditioned us to predict or to expect something negative is about to happen. And that gets us back into this, this topic of change that we want to look into today. You've had a lot of experiences around change in your life, some positive and some negative, but it's the negative ones that you remember more quickly, more easily. So when we start talking about change, Something needs to change. We're going to change things. Your implicit memory kicks in and something in your brain is telling you this is not a good idea. Uh, change is a threat. Everybody recognize this image on the screen? The Casey's logo, right? Wrong. It's the old Casey's logo. And then they changed it. I don't remember if it was a year ago or a couple years ago, we started seeing the new logo and the new font as we were driving around town. And pretty much everyone in our family vehicle, when they saw the new logo, would mutter. <laughs> Why did they do that? Why did they change it? I like the old one better. That is a corporate logo. Uh, pretty innocuous change. Will not impact our day-to-day -day living whatsoever. Mutter, 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 mutter. There are other changes in life that are completely disruptive. 
to the way we live our lives, the way we relate to one another. Say hello to the last couple of years. I don't remember exactly when it was, but it was sometime before the pandemic that Pastor Mike was preaching a sermon on the rapidly accelerating rate of change that we are living with in our culture. And he referenced a book by Thomas Friedman, uh, Thank You for Being Late. And, and in the book, Friedman is pointing out all the ways technology and uh, computers and microchips and everything that's changing, and it's changing faster than we're able to keep up with it, and trying to help us understand you know, the amount of change that, that's happening all around us, that we're just living in it. He tried to make a comparison. If, if automobiles, if the Volkswagen Beetle 1971 had changed uh, in the similar way that microchips, computer chips had changed, then today that Volkswagen Beetle would go 300,000 miles per hour. It would get 2 million miles per gallon and it would only cost 4 cents. That'd make a difference in the family budget, wouldn't it? <laughs> Lots of change all around us. And th this was happening prior to the pandemic. Then the pandemic hit, and to borrow a phrase from Spaceballs, we went from warp speed to ludicrous speed. <laughs> Two people have seen Spaceballs. Thank you. <laughs> um, all kinds of change. And I wonder if you've heard this in the place where you work or in organizations that you are a part of. Have, have you heard this statement by someone in the last couple of years? The things that used to work no longer work. We actually had a, a meeting about this here at Hope just this week. Uh, leaders, pastors from all the Hope campuses just kind of talking about, you know, how is change impacting the way we do ministry? The, the gospel never changes. Our mission and vision, it's still the same. But the way we carry out the mission and vision, doesn't it necessarily change in the times we're living in? Doesn't it absolutely need to change the way we think about how are we the church? What does it mean to be the church? People who study the church world and church culture, they say the last two years has kind of fast forwarded everything. People who are predicting or anticipating where's the church going to be in a decade, we're already there. And so that's a lot of change in a short amount of time. No wonder people are saying the things that used to work no longer work. And when the things that used to work no longer work, what's necessary? What, what's required? Change. According to the Center for Creative Leadership, 75% of change initiatives fail because of resistant company culture. 75% of change initiatives fail not because they're terrible ideas, fails because the company is resisting the change. Uh, Gallup came out with the results of uh, some research they'd been doing on faith in America a week ago, two weeks ago. Uh, the number of people, the percent of people who believe in God in this country has now dropped to the lowest it has ever been. All kinds of reasons for that, undoubtedly. Might this be one of the reasons? M might part of the reason that people are Stopping believing in God or not believing in God is because we are so resistant to change in church world. Whether you're leading a church or leading a company, a business, a classroom, whether you're just leading yourself, you're leading a home, this is our dilemma. We know change is needed and we are resistant to change. We're like Melvin Udall, Jack Nicholson's character in As Good As It Gets, bursts into his counselor's office. He just blurts out, help, help me. And he said, I've, I've been trying some changes. It doesn't feel like it's getting better. It kind of feels like it's getting worse. He knows change is needed. He's very resistant to change. Do you hear what he said as he's walking through the, the waiting room, the reception area? He says, what if this is as good as it gets? We know change is needed. We're resistant to change. We, we spend a lot of time identifying the problem. Let's take the rest of our time to uh, point to some solutions. Where does our help come from? And that gets us back to Psalm 103 in the words of King David. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things God does for me. And the next thing that we read, David just starts making a list 
of all the good things that God does for him. If our brains are sort of wired to focus on the negative, maybe an important part of the change process, it, it might begin with simply making a list so that we can remember the good things God does for us. Maybe your list and David's list would be similar. God forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. God redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. God fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. He revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. This is who God is. This is what God does. And yet we forget it. And when we forget, maybe it would be an important thing for us to have a list that we can go back to to remind ourselves, here's the good things that God has done in my life. When we forget the good things God's doing in our life, maybe it would be an important thing to turn to Jesus, the one who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one that in our Bible reading we heard, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Never changes. This is who God is and this is what God does and, and that never changes. So part of the good news for us this morning is the never-changing God is always changing us. The never-changing God is always changing us. The more we grow in our faith, the more we are able to remember the good things God does for us because as we grow in our faith, we begin to trust that God is good, that God is faithful, that God comes through that God doesn't fail. Think of the people of Israel. They're in bondage in Egypt for over 400 years, and then God finally rescues them, delivers them, and they're on their way to the promised land, but they're not to the promised land yet. They're in that in-between time. And they're no longer in bondage, but everything has changed. And it doesn't take long before the people start complaining because everything feels uncertain everything feels unfamiliar and uncomfortable. And they cry out to God, they complain to God. Basically, they're saying, we want to go back to what was familiar. They got all these questions for God. Where are we going to get food to eat in the wilderness? How are we going to find water to drink? And uh, why did you bring us out of Egypt? Didn't we tell you this was going to be a, a bad idea? Don't you know, God, that change is negative? God listens to their pl- complaint and God answers their complaint by giving them bread from heaven. Let me read a little bit about how this happens in Exodus chapter 16. The Israelites were puzzled when they saw this bread from heaven. What is it? They asked each other. And Moses told them it's the food the Lord has given you to eat. The Israelites called the food manna. Do you know how you ask the question, what is it in the Hebrew language? You say manna. Manna is the Hebrew phrase. It's a question. What is it? They, they literally eat their questions. I think about that. Remember the way this worked? God would send manna. Every morning they'd, they'd come out of their tents and there'd be manna all over the ground. And they would pick the manna that they needed for that day. If they picked too much, it would rot. It would spoil overnight. And so this is part of the process of God doing this transformational work in the life of God's people so they learn to trust God. Uh, They're eating their questions. What is it? What is God doing? Why did he bring us out here? Where where are we going to get water? How long are we going to be out here? Are we there yet? They're eating their questions, but in the process, they go to bed every night and they're like, hey, God provided for me today. And they wake up the morning, God provided for me today. God didn't fail me today. God didn't fail me today. And as that went on, day after day after day, maybe they got to a point where they could begin to go to bed trusting, if God didn't fail me today, if God did good things for me today, maybe I can trust God to do that for me tomorrow as well. It's part of the way God's transforming work happens in our lives. It happens through the people of Israel in the wilderness, in the Exodus story in the Old Testament. The Apostle Paul talks about this 
process of God changing us and transforming us. All kinds of places in the New Testament he talks about it. 2 Corinthians 3 is one of the places. Let's read this out loud together. The Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. For followers of Jesus Christ, change is not something to fear. Change is not something to resist. Change is the goal. Following Jesus is a growing experience. It's one of our core values at this church. It comes from verses like this and a whole bunch of other verses. The more we follow Jesus, this transformation process is underway where more and more all the time we reflect to the people closest to us, to the world around us, we reflect the image of God's son, Jesus. Uh, let me read through just four other places where we see this idea. 2 Corinthians 5.17, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Change. Galatians 6.15, what counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. Romans 12.2, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And it's not a one and done kind of deal. This is an ongoing process. Colossians 1 verse 6, the good news is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives. By changing lives. Now, we need to be honest and confess that we have a lot of Israelite in us. Just like the Israelites started to complain when things got uncertain and uncomfortable, they longed for what was familiar. This is the pattern for all of us. You have familiar patterns of relating to God, you have familiar patterns of relating to the people in your life. And just like at the macro level, corporations, companies, businesses, churches are starting to say, What do we do? Because the way things used to work, no longer work, there comes a time in each of our lives where we have to kind of explore that process for ourselves as individuals. The things that used to work for me no longer work. The things that used to work in my marriage. The things that used to work in my family system. The things that used to work in my friendships, the things that used to work in my relationship with God to help me feel close to God, to help me trust God and know that God loves me. Those things no longer are working. Now what? Everything feels uncertain, uncomfortable, unfamiliar. Now what? There was a book that came out two months into the pandemic, uh, May of 2020. The book is called Life is in the Transitions, written by a guy named Bruce Failer. It's a, a change management book. He talks about transitions in life. Some of them are super positive transitions. Uh, our oldest son, Dalton, recently graduated from college on Friday night. And uh, yesterday morning, I was up in St. Paul helping him move into his first apartment. Got a job, a, a new apartment. He's a college graduate. Lots of transitions in a short amount of time for Dalton. And most of them are good, right? But there's still some stress connected with all of that. There are other transitions we go through in life that are completely overwhelming in the kind of stress they bring into our life. Uh, he refers to these kinds of uh, events that we go through as life quakes. Losing a job. The death of someone you love. And the grief process that follows that. Changing careers. Changing relationships. Becoming sober becoming healthier. These life quakes are completely disruptive to our way of life. These life quakes knock us off our feet. And he says when you go through a life quake, when you experience a life quake, typical life quake takes three to five years for us to get through. We're what? A little over two and a half years into a pandemic? Not over yet. The, the life quake that's connected to what we've been going through, it's not over yet. So think of the life quakes that you've gone through in your life. Some of you might be in the middle of one right now. Thank goodness they don't take 40 years like the people of Israel in the wilderness, but when you're in the middle of a life quake, three to five years feels like an eternity. Change is hard. When we're going through change, when we're going through something like a life quake, our implicit memory is going to kick in. The, this Velcro part of the amygdala that helps us remember negative experience is going to kick in and say, That's the, kind, that, the last time I went through a life quake, it almost took me out. 
I don't want to ever experience something like that. I don't want to feel the way I felt when I was going through that experience. I want to stop feeling that way as soon as possible. The uncomfortable uncertainty of uh, change and, and what is unfamiliar. So part of what it means to be people who are growing in faith and maturing in faith, this transformation process that God does in our life, with God's help, we develop the discipline to remain in the uncomfortable uncertainty of life. And not escape it, but allow God to do God's transforming work in the midst of it. For people of faith, this maturing process, we develop the discipline with God's help, by God's grace, to remain in the uncomfortable uncertainties of life. Remain in me, Jesus says. Abide in me. Everything else around you is changing and chaotic. It feels out of control and you're longing for the familiar. Let Jesus be your familiar. The one who never changes. He's always changing you. Uh, one more verse as we get ready to start winding this thing down. This is 2 Corinthians 5.14. So I'll all read this out loud together. Christ's love controls us. Uh -huh. How do you like that? I mean, one of, the, one of the things we hate about change is we love to be in control. And when things are changing, we, we start to lose control. And we certainly don't like how that feels. We don't like how it feels if someone is controlling us. So for some of you, we read a verse or see a verse, Christ's love controls us. Your implicit memory is danger, danger, danger. Don't, don't go there. What if the most important word in this verse is not control, but it's love? It's almost vacation Bible school time, Hope Ranch. We've got a ranch theme for vacation Bible school. The, the idea behind this verse, it's a ranch term. Did you know they had ranches in Israel in the Old Te uh, New Testament? So some translations, instead of control, it says constrains or compels or urges us on. But it's a ranch term. I grew up on a farm. Most of the time the cattle are out in the pasture. But a couple of times a year, dad needed to give them medication or vaccinations to keep them healthy and growing. And we were not like a Yellowstone ranch. We didn't go out and lasso them up and give them the... We, we herded them into the pen... And then on the side of the pen, there was this narrow chute, a cattle chute. And one by one, they go into that chute. And at the end of it, there's a head gate. And when they're in the head gate, that's a safe place where you can administer uh, the medication that's going to keep them healthy and growing. When a cow goes into a, a chute, it can't back up. It can't turn around. There's only one way to go, and that is forward. That's the idea behind Christ's love controls us. Christ's love compels us. The love of Christ holds us and squeezes us and pushes us. It moves us to a place where, as we're growing in our faith, we recognize, I'm not turning around. It's not going to do me any good to turn around. I can't turn around. I can only go forward. I can only go forward with Jesus, and I'm willing to do it because I trust in God's love for me. That if I keep going with Jesus, there are good things for me. I'm remembering the good things God has done for me in the past. The healing God has provided. The help God has provided. The hope God has provided. And I'm trusting there's more of that ahead of me. Jack Nicholson won uh, the Best Actor Oscar for his portrayal of Melvin Udall in this film, As Good As It Gets. Not a family-friendly film. Uh, but it asks some important questions. Like, do you believe change is possible for individuals, for relationships, for the world? At one point in the film, the three main characters are on a road trip from New York City to Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, one night, Melvin and Carol, who is played by uh, Helen Hunt, uh, they decide to go out for dinner. They show up at the restaurant and they tell Melvin, this is a fancy restaurant, you need a coat and a tie. Here, we've got some in the closet, you can wear these. He's like, no, I'm not putting those on. So he leaves Carol at the restaurant, speeds to the closest clothing store, gets himself a coat and tie, comes back, and finally they're able to sit down for dinner, and here's what happens. Take a look. You want to dance? Well, I've been thinking about that since you brought it up before. And? No. I don't get this place. They make me buy a new outfit. They let you in in a house dress. I don't get it. What? 
Wait, well, no, wait, why? Where are you going? Now, why? I mean, I... Uh... Well, I didn't mean it that way. I mean, you gotta sit down. You can still give me the dirty look. Just sit down and give it to me. Pay me a compliment, Melvin. I need one. Quick. You have no idea how much what you just said hurt my feelings. The mono minute that someone gets that they need you, they threaten to walk out. A compliment is something nice about somebody else. This is a request from June. And now or never. Okay. Happy anniversary. And mean it. I've got this, what, ailment. <laughs> My doctor, a shrink that I used to go to all the time, he says that in 50 or 60% of the cases, a pill really helps. I hate pills. Very dangerous thing, pills. Hate. I'm using the word hate here about pills. Hate. My compliment is, that night when you came over and told me that you would never... Um... um all right, well, uh, you were there. You know, you know what you said. Well, my compliment to you is... The next morning, I started taking the pills. I don't quite get how that's a compliment for me. You make me want to be a better man. That's maybe the best compliment of my life. <laughs> well, maybe I overshot a little because I was aiming at just enough to keep you from walking out. <laughs> 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 What's the name of the cow that I showed at the Hardin County Fair? What's the name of the God who comes from heaven to earth? Born in a manger in Bethlehem. Grows up, goes through every kind of life quake that you and I experience in our life. And is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What's the name of that God? Jesus and Jesus loves you and Jesus forgives you and Jesus is tender and compassionate with you as you go through these changes. The, the love of Carol is compelling Melvin to become a better man. Would you allow the love of Jesus to compel you, to urge you to become a better follower of Jesus Christ? Everything around you is crazy, chaotic, changing, feels like you're standing on sinking ground. It's time to stand on the solid rock. Let's stand and let's sing to the one who never changes right now.
fail you. God will not fail you. He is never going to change the way that he feels about you. The truth that he is a God that is good and that is kind, that is present, that makes sure that you are never alone. That will not change. Build your life on his love. You'll be able to stand when the winds and the rains come, because they will. But when we lean on Jesus, we're gonna be just fine. Go in peace this week, hope. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. We've got prayer partners up on both sides of the room. We'd love to pray with you today. Thank you so much for joining us. What a really important message in this world that's always changing, always in flux to know that God never changes and he's always changing us. Whether maybe you're in a space where you're in a life quake, uh, as Pastor Scott was saying, or uh, maybe you're in a place where things really need to change and you're, and you're looking for what that change looks like. God has a word for you, and we're so glad you worship with us today. Yep. So even if you're online or if you're at a local site, wherever you are, um, we are just so thankful that you came today. And again, just a reminder to you're always invited here in person too. We'd love to see you next week. We're praying for you this week. Uh, have a great day.